Dr. Eilers, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How is your day going? How are you doing? <sighs> it's been it's been a busy one. It's been yeah. an intense day here at work. Not that that's necessarily bad or unusual, but yeah, that's kind of how most days are around here, honestly. What's uh, what's like a typical day look like for you, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so they're pretty much the same every day. I can tell you my exact schedule because it doesn't vary much. So um, as far as my work schedule goes, 8.30 to 9 is typically like a testing feedback visit. So someone I've done some psychological testing with, we meet up, I walk them through their report, show them how it's going, give them some treatment ideas, hopefully, typically. Um, 9 to 11 a.m., four days a week. Wednesdays are a little bit different. I run an intensive outpatient program for adults with severe depression or anxiety. So that's group therapy. Um, it's a mix of processing and education. Um, and then somewhere between 11 to 5 is a mix of new patient visits for testing, doing actual testing, and individual therapy. So it's busy. <laughs> busy, 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 man. Yeah. Hey, so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you noticed this. I just started doing it this way. I just record right off the bat. Um, sure. No worries. I just find it's more organic that way. I like that a Absolutely. little bit better. But um yeah, man, I just want to say, like, first and foremost, like, thanks for, for coming on here. And thanks for giving us your perspectives. And uh, also, congratulations on the book, man. I, uh, I read it, I loved it. And I had to buy it as, as a gift for a friend. Actually, it was so good, man. I'm really glad to hear that. Thanks for the kind words. And yeah, thank you for having me too. I always appreciate opportunities to come talk about the things I'm passionate about and reach people who I wouldn't normally get to talk to. So it's a win win for sure. I know uh, if my audio quality is not the greatest, I know um, we have white noise machines here in this facility that run constantly. So I know my sound quality might be a little bit lacking, but there's nothing I can do about it, unfortunately. It is what it is, man. We'll, we'll work with it. What, um, if you don't mind me asking, like what kind of sparked your uh, interest, I guess, to like go from, obviously like you're still a practicing doctor, but right. um, like what made you shift to, you know, focusing all, a lot of energy on like writing a book? It was kind of around, so I've, I've been, I've been practicing where I practice now, but this clinic for uh, close to five and a half years now. And this is a pretty underserved area. It's not like a rural area, everything like that. We just don't have very many providers. And I've, I've always known that I kind of have a different approach to therapy and mental health in general. Than, I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just different. Um, but a lot of people respond really well to it. And I ended up, for all of those reasons, having a pretty lengthy wait list for therapy. And I don't really like that. I mean, like from a business perspective, it's good, I guess, but I don't like making people wait. You know, if someone really wants to hear what I have to say and talk to me and try to get some things figured out, I like to do that ASAP. And so I actually started writing, not necessarily planning to write a book that I was going to sell. I wanted to actually write like a brief handout, if that makes sense. It sounds kind of silly now, but um, like something I can give people on my wait list, like, you know, in the meantime, here's some ideas, because I was ending up telling people the same things over and over and over again. I'm like, I should just write some of this down and give it to people. But I guess I had a lot more, mind, uh, lot more in my mind than I realized, because by the time I like, felt like I had written all the stuff I wanted to write down, it was like 40,000 words. Um, and then at one, at one point I started writing those chapter breaks too. the more, the parts that were more kind of diary ish and those started to flow really naturally. And I, I realized at that point, I'm like, I think this is a book. And I think more than just the people on my therapy wait list might want to see this book. So that's pretty much what started. it. Yeah. I like how it was written because it's not like, um, I mean, like, Dude, I read literally 90% of the content I read is about like psychology or mental health or yeah. some sort of personal accountability or something along the lines of self-development. And it wasn't written the same way because it was so personal. Like just the way that like, I think one of the first stories you tell is about like a fishing hole where you're like kind of nervous about it and you have to go back and face your fears. Like yeah. starting with that, I'm like, man, this is like, 
uh, what's his name? Joshua Medcalf. Is that his name? There's like another guy. I who don't know. Wood, that he, he's that got, is. I think he's got a book called Chop Wood, Carry Water, but it's very, it's like okay. kind of like I gravitate towards that because I like the story aspect of it. Like, it's like, yeah. you're not just hitting with facts. It's like, this is something that I get to know you a little bit better. I get to see like mm -hmm. a dive inside your mind. So it just seemed way more personal. Exactly. That's 100% what I was aiming for, because that is a big part of how I do therapy. I think it's really easy. Um, a lot of self-help books, I feel like, air like towards one side or the other. It's either like this book is written by a peer and it's got stories and it's in layman's terms and stuff like that. But this person maybe doesn't really have a lot of professional knowledge and their life experiences and first person accounts may not really relate to you the reader or you got books written by mental health professionals that tend to be more clinical and impersonal and almost more textbooky and i was basically trying to like I, I didn't actually set out with this in mind it's sort of what evolved over time but as i was writing i realized that's kind of what i'm doing is like i want to make a hybrid i want to kind of blend both of those approaches to where you feel like this is a person writing this book who by reading and knowing a little bit about them, you kind of have a relationship with this person, but they're, they're clinically knowledgeable. They're, they're scientifically knowledgeable. And this isn't just like, here's my life and here's how things went for me. And maybe this lands for you because that's what I found that people really want in therapy. People want someone who's personable, someone who is relatable, someone who is okay with occasionally talking about themselves, but also someone who's going to be like, well, have you read this study? Or, you know, here's what science tells us about this. And to bring that all together, give you both sides of it and not just one or the other. So that's, I'm glad you picked up on that because that is 100% the vibe that I was going for. Yeah, no, 100%, because I appreciated it so much because it, it provides, in my eyes, like kind of a beauty that I won't be able to, because like part of my motivation, like to start this podcast was I wanted to have like something that, you know, my 14 or 15 or 16 year old self would actually like comprehend and grasp, whereas like, you know, I, I reflect back, I look back and I'm like, you know, I got so much good information, but because of who it was said by or how it was said, I was just unreceptive to it. Yeah. So I, I like that you kind of provide, you know, a similar vibe in terms of like, this is like the down home, like, I'm just going to talk to you and tell you how it is. But then you also have, the, you know, the education behind it where like, you don't get the same thing probably that I get where people are like, well, you're not a doctor, like this isn't, you know, where you have like that education behind it, where it's yeah. like, no, I actually am a doctor and a real person. So there's <laughs> yeah. that. Like, It's funny that you said 14 to 16 too, because um, my probably the hardest period of time in life for me was like, probably say probably 14 to 17, 15 in particular was a very rough year for me. And I kind of the goal I had in mind is I wanted to write a book that I would have read at that time, not necessarily a book for teenagers per se, but a book for people who are really in it, people who are really in a dark place. That's the other thing is a lot of, of self-help books I feel are written for people who are like already okay-ish and need a little boost. Like, like I'm all right, but I'm not great. I wanted to write a book for people who are like actively not all right because I feel like that is, that's a missed audience and actually going through, um, I did end up self-publishing this book, but I considered um, going through a traditional publisher and spoke with several. And a lot of the feedback I got was like, you may not want to write for this population because they're not the people who are buying books. Because like people who are in the midst of a severe depression, like often maybe don't, they're not working sometimes so they may not have you know disposable income where they can spend $15 on a book and I'm like well I get that but I don't care <laughs> that's not it, it's it, I'm in a good position because I have a career I have a job so I have the luxury and I know some authors don't I'm not trying to I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here my book doesn't have to be a financial success though that wasn't really my endeavor that wasn't really my goal my goal was to write a book that reaches people who are not currently being reached.
if I make some money while I'm doing that, I'm certainly not going to be mad about that. But if I don't, that's okay because that's not why I'm doing it. So that, yeah, I wanted to, wanted to write to people who didn't feel like there was content out there for them. Because I know when I was at that place, I was more drawn to things that I felt were validated. I was really into like heavy metal and horror movies and anime and things like that because I got the feeling like, okay, there's people out there who kind of feel like me. And, and even if they're not saying, like they weren't saying, I know what to do about it. But it was just nice to know that I wasn't alone in that. And that's what I was going for is, is to try to show both sides of that. What if there was someone who got it and who had a plan? Wouldn't that be great? I, said, I wasn't going to be reading Eat, Pray, Love at 16. Or Brene, like, I love Brene Brown, but Brene Brown is not what I needed at that point in my life. You know, She's what I need now. That's good for me now, now that I'm like, I'm all right, I'm looking for that next step. But, you know, Daring Greatly is not going to pull you out of a dark depression, I don't think. No, I'm no, sure no. It, has for some it probably has for some. I shouldn't say that, but well, it's not I think the vibe I was going for. And I think, I think you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no, no, no. I get you because Daring Greatly is a book I read last year as well, actually. Sure. And um, I, when I read it, I was thinking like, I don't think I could have read this when I was going through what I was going through, but that's right. a great book for kind of processing the aftermath. That's why I look exactly. at that book. Exactly. Yep. But um, I was going to ask you, like, I mean, and there's a couple of questions, but I guess it kind of starts with, and before I kind of give my interpretation, I wanted to ask you, like, you started by saying um, you don't really have like the same, I guess, I don't remember the exact words you use, but kind of like the same perspectives as like traditional mental health practices, or can you kind of elaborate on that? And like, cause I kind of picked up on that, but yeah. I, before I give my interpretation, I wanted to hear your first, your perspective. Yeah. There's a few areas, honestly, where I vary a little bit from what are sort of the mainstream, like cultural trends in mental health. One is the use of self-disclosure. So this is not unique to uh, the grad schools that I attended because I've talked to many different colleagues from many different programs. Like we basically all had this same experience, which is we are actively discouraged from really talking about ourselves at all. And I, to an extent, I understand the wisdom behind that because I've, I've, heard, I've worked with therapy clients and I've heard them say like, yeah, my last therapist did nothing but talk about themselves. That is obviously not good. That is, that's not helpful. But I also think it's not good to never talk about yourself because I want, it's important to me to kind of pull back the veil a little bit. And I know that someone who was meeting me for the first time today, I'm, I don't mean this to sound arrogant, but I, I know I probably come across as like someone who's pretty much got their life together. And that isn't necessarily untrue now. And it's a very subjective thing, I know. Um, but it has very much not been true for large chunks of my life. And I think that's important to know because when you're in that dark place, everyone else seems fine. And not only do they seem fine, it seems like they've always been fine. And I think you mentally create this divide between like people like you you know, as, as in I'm struggling right now and like people who seem okay. And it's easy to get yourself in the mindset of I, I will, I'm not that person. That's a different group of people. Those aren't my people. I'm always going to be this misfit, this outcast, this person who's struggling. And I think you can be both because I think I am both. And I, I'm not afraid in a way that's appropriate and, and maintains the focus of the therapy session being on the client and not me. I'm not afraid to talk about myself. I'm not afraid to let people know I have a personal stake in this. I'm not only, not everything I say to you is going to be something I learned in classroom. Some of it's stuff that I've had to use in my own personal life to get where I am today. Um, so I do engage in some self-disclosure. This is like a repeated quote in, in mental health training. And it's a quote that I don't like. I don't like most quotes, honestly. But it's... Um, if you start talking about yourself in the therapy session, the therapy session will often become about you. Like, like you don't want your client to start feeling like they need to attend to your emotional needs. And, and you don't want that. Absolutely, I agree. But my, my response to that has always been, if you can't occasionally 
talk about yourself a little bit in a way that's appropriate and relevant to what you're, it's gotta be relevant. Don't just do it randomly. If you can't do that without completely losing your grasp of the therapy session and having it completely flipped to where your client's trying to take care of you and counsel you, I would argue that maybe you're not that good of a therapist because it's possible. I do it every day. <laughs> it can be done. Um, so that's one area where I'm different. The other is I very, very strongly believe that a, a good therapist needs to do a lot more than just be a good listener. You do need to be a good listener. That's an important part of your job. But I've heard a lot of people say that they see that as their entire job to create a safe space, to be non-judgmental, to be empathic, to practice active listening, to validate. And I do all those things. And I think all those things are important. But that's not all I do. Because some of the problems that people face have actual answers. Like, for example, insomnia. Insomnia is not some unsolvable problem that people just need a safe space to discuss and talk about how much it sucks to have insomnia. It does suck to have insomnia. But there are actual strategies and techniques and solutions that we know based on research and studies that for many people will fix insomnia. And I think it's important to educate people on that. So I'm very active in reviewing clinical trials and studies and reading other authors and disseminating that information to my clients. And again, that's the same kind of balance I try to find in the book. It's a mix of personal and technical. I think most people who are really struggling and don't just need a little bit of help, a little pick me up, need both. If you just give one or the other, you're not going to help people get all the way to where they need to be. So that's that could have been a one hour speech. I condensed it, but <laughs> that's sort of my therapeutic orientation in however long that was just now. No, I, I love that. And I, I want to go back to the first part you were talking about as well. But before I do, I just want to say like the second part you're talking about how like giving advice and researching peer reviewed studies and all of that stuff, like that sounds to me what a doctor should do. Right. In, any, in any field, like whether you're talking about psychology mm -hmm. or anything like, you know, I get you go to yeah. school and college and I didn't have that experience. So maybe I've got an unbiased opinion, but like, you know, eventually that information should or does become outdated, in my opinion, like you should be up like updating your, right. your repertoire right. or, you know, for me, like I go out and buy a new tool. That means I can do a new thing in construction. Like, isn't that the same exactly. everywhere else? It, yeah, see. I personally agree with your perspective on that because, and, and I got to say something about the tool thing too, but we'll come back to that in a second. Um, I like to, yeah, it's, it's like you said, this, that approach of just being a really good listener and, and creating safe space, that wouldn't fly in any other helping profession. Imagine a physical therapist, like asking you about where it hurts, having you describe your pain, having you talk about the injury. And like, again, yeah, you probably do need to do those things. And then you're done. <laughs> that would be a terrible physical therapy session because you didn't actually do anything. It might feel good to be validated and be understood and have someone else know what you've been through. But you're also at some point going to be expecting like, well, can you tell me what to do to hurt less? You're going to yeah. have that expectation. And, and not only that you're going to do some of that work in the physical therapy session, but that they're going to give you some things you can do at home to continue that work in between visits. And I see... I see my job as essentially being the mental health version of physical therapy. I think it's analogous to that where, yeah, I need to know what caused this. How did this happen to you? That, that is important. But we also got to figure out what to do about it now in your actual current life or you're going to stay stuck. Um, and the tool thing, I got into a heated debate in, in my doctoral program with, with a, a classmate because he made, he made the analogy, he, he said, as a therapist, I feel like we are just tools. We, we were talking about, like, can you get someone to engage in the therapy process if they're somewhat unwilling? Which a lot of people, even though they voluntarily come to therapy, they have mixed feelings and they might not be all in on day one, which I think is very understandable. And his perspective was, 
all you can do is is just like kind of tell them what you have to offer and 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 he said like we are we are just tools and as a tool you know they got to decide whether to pick you up or not and to to an extent i agree you cannot force someone to engage in therapy there, there's nothing i can do to make someone be on there this is true but i absolutely believe i have influence and I found his tool analogy to actually be perfect in supporting my perspective because I used to have really crappy tools. I'm not talking about therapy tools. I'm talking about actual like power tools. I had like the cheapest stuff and it sucked and I didn't like using it. And so I avoided home improvement projects and I got stressed out anytime something in my house needed to be repaired because my tools sucked and I didn't like using them. And I remember one time I was at Home Depot and I decided I needed a new drill. I'm like, I'm gonna try getting something nice this time. I'm gonna actually get like a high-end brand, good quality. And it turned out that when I had good tools, I actually liked doing home renovations and repairs. I actually got kind of passionate about it. I bought more tools. We're renovating a fixer upper house now. I would have never done that 10 years ago. And so my argument to him was like, yes, we are. Some tools are way more attractive than others, to, uh, you know, like as far as whether you want to use them or like cars, cars are tools, right? But would you rather drive a Camry or Ferrari? Those are not, those are not equally <laughs> appealing options. And a lot of people aren't passionate about cars until they get to experience a nice car. And then they're like, oh, wait, this is actually really interesting. And I think therapy can be like that too. So that was a, that's a very apt metaphor. I think that you made there. I think even like, um, it's like, man, I wouldn't even say that the therapist is like the tool. I'd say like the therapist is like the operator, like, cause there's so many tools you can use. Like, like, say you sit down, like, and I mean, I don't know what being a doctor's like, but I know what being like a salesman's like, and I can tell you that, mm -hmm. you know, just cause someone might have a problem and you might have the perfect product to solve that. But if you don't use the right tool to convey that, then it's like, you didn't use the wrong solution. You just use the wrong tool. Like just, you know, either sharpen your tools or get some better ones. Like that's really it. Like if, and I mean, not a knock on your, uh, on the guy that you went to school with, but it's like, man, if you feel like you're, you're useless and you're just like a tool that someone has to either pick up or put down, like, why don't you make yourself more valuable so they'll want to pick it up? That's exactly what I was saying. And I, I don't think he would have said he felt useless. Like, I think he was totally comfortable with that. It, it, I think it was his way of-, of Yeah, it's more of a straw with, man. It's more of a straw yeah, man, yeah, saying, but I get yeah. it. Yeah, like it's his way of dealing with people who, who aren't willing to engage in the therapeutic process. And no matter how good you are, that will happen. That is, that is an inevitable part of, of our job. That's true. With any healthcare job, non-compliance will always exist. But I don't think it is a variable that we have no influence over whatsoever. A lot of people, I, I kind of carved a like a niche for myself early on in my career as being the therapist that they would send people to who were kind of over therapy. Because I worked in this private, my first real therapy job was in this private practice. Um, and they had a lot of long-term clients who had, who had seen a lot of different therapists and who felt really stuck and who were really ambivalent about engaging in therapy. What a lot of my colleagues would have described as difficult clients. People who don't just come in with like, here's what I need help with. I'm ready. Let's go. People who come in, they're like, I don't know if I give a shit about this or not. Those are my people. because <laughs> I understand that feeling. And it kind of became a thing like, send your difficult clients to Scott because he likes them and he's good with them. The ironic thing is the, the really super motivated, I'm ready, go getter people, I'm probably not great with them. It's almost like, I don't know what to do with them. It's like, you got this already. I don't really know what you need me for. Um, so I, I honestly prefer working with the people who are not on board with it every day. The people who need a lot from me that's that's when I feel I'm at my best that's what brings out my best self as a therapist so that's that's kind of my zone I guess I love that I love it you're like I want to I want people that are on the same brainwave I like that I like as well like uh circling back I will circle back to what I was going to say about your first point about this the storytelling and kind of 
I guess, yeah, you said self-disclosure. I like that when you said that, like, um, like storytelling and like, even the way that you wrote your book, like the way that you told the stories about the fishing hole and then going back to face your fears, spoil alert for anybody that hasn't read the first chapter yet. But, um, like, it's like, it's kind of, uh, I guess it's so self-evident that as humans, like we learn through stories, like you want to take any religion, any, like any way that we learn, like, it's like the history books are written in a way that it tells a story. It doesn't just say a bunch of facts, like this president did this or this, you know, prime minister of Canada did this. Right. Like it's like, it tells the story because we learn through stories. Like, even if you look back at like caveman depictions in caves, like we learn through stories. So it just seems so, it seems so natural. It's like, why don't we write books like this? I wish I knew the, um, I don't know if I stole this quote from somebody or if this is actually my quote. It sounds too profound to be me, but I cannot explicitly source it to another person. So for the time being, I'm gonna claim it as me until someone corrects me. Wouldn't be the first time I thought a quote came from me that it didn't though, I've done that. Um, but something I say a lot like to my supervisees um, in, the, in the clinic is validation is your bridge to behavioral change. It's like I was talking about insomnia before, right? There are really good and effective protocols for dealing with insomnia, for helping a person fix their sleep. But sometimes you need to get a little buy-in from that person first before they're willing to really try those things. And that buy-in doesn't have to literally be like, I too have had insomnia and this has helped me. It can be that, but it's just that little touch here and there of like not being this um, like obscure, distant person who has no relationship or has no connection to the people you're working with. And in therapy, people are going to be really vulnerable with you. They're going to tell you stuff they don't tell anybody else. They might cry in front of you and they don't cry in front of anybody else. And I think it's okay if we got to earn that a little bit. If, if I have to, if I have to be a little open, I mean, I'm going to have limits, of course, but if I have to be a little open myself for you to feel like this is a place you can do that, then I will do that. And again, that's the approach I tried to take in the book too. Like to me, the book is essentially like an, I wanted it to kind of feel like a therapy session or probably many therapy sessions with me. Um, and I think if I'm going to expect anyone to care about the words I'm writing, just saying like, hey, I have a degree. I went to school for this. I do this for a living. I don't think that's enough because there's a lot of people out there who have degrees and do this for a living who aren't great, in my opinion. And I think part of getting that buy-in from people is, is just giving them a little bit of like, I do kind of get this. Because if you feel like, if you think you're the only person who's ever felt what you felt, thought what you thought, dealt with what you dealt with, how are you gonna believe in anyone else's plan? Like, okay, sure, this has worked for other people, but if those people were nothing like me, what, what good is that plan for me? That works for them. Again, it's that when you're in that really dark place, it's easy to separate yourself from others and see yourself as different and somehow more broken, more damaged, more unfixable. And even if you believe that there are in general, you know, treatments for depression or anxiety or trauma, it's easy to convince yourself like, well, they won't work for me. Something about me is gonna prevent this from being effective. And if through telling someone a, a little story here and there, if I can make them understand like oh, other people have felt this and have kind of turned this around and gotten themselves in a decent place, if that's what I have to do to get that by and I'll do it. I think there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think it's good. Yeah, I, I think there's a huge difference that I, like a lot of people maybe don't differentiate between, which is like kind of like airing out dirty laundry while it's still dirty and then telling the story of how you got it clean. Like there's a huge difference. Like there's um, what's it? The story of like the first four minute mile, like it had never been done before. And then some Olympic runner from the States like comes out, runs the first four minute mile. And then the after that, every year after that, there's people that run it. Like, it's like a four yeah. minute mile is like kind of standard now. Like that's like, you know, not standard by any means, but I mean, it, it it's had not been like super rare anymore. 
Yeah. Well, at first it was unprecedented and now it's like, right. yeah, it's been done. Yeah. But it's like now, like when we can hear the story of look, like, you know, whether it's your 14 year old self or my 14 year old self, like, it's like, look, man, like you might not have picked where you're starting from right now. You might not have, you know, maybe you're responsible for some of it. Maybe you're not, whatever, but like someone's been here before, man. And this is beatable, Like you can do this. And, and like, this is X, Y, and Z different factors that might've landed you there or whatever it could be. But it's like, dude, this is a winnable fight. This isn't insurmountable, right? Like, it's like kind of like the hope that tells people like you can climb it. It might be like Everest for you, but you could still climb this mountain. Absolutely. And, and that's where I think too, just like, if at 14, if someone had just told, if someone had described my life to me right now, someone had said, you know, this is what your days are going to look like. Here's what you're going to be doing. Here's what, you know, the family you'll have at home, whatnot. If someone had just said to me at 14, that's what your life's going to look like at 38, I wouldn't have found that reassuring because I wouldn't have believed them. Because not for, for, for not one second would that have seemed like a plausible outcome for me. So to, to just give, like, to try to give that hope or that reassurance without acknowledgement, without validation, even if it's real and correct, I think usually lands empty to people when they're in that spot because it just feels too far away. Like if, if, if it'd be like telling someone like that, I don't know who it was who ran the first four minute mile, but like the first time they ever ran a mile, I'm guessing it was like eight minutes or whatever. I don't know. I guess it depends on how old they were. And if you had told that person that day, you're going to run a four minute, four minute mile someday, I bet, I bet they would not have been like, oh, oh, really? I'm, oh, that's cool. Thank you for telling me that. I'm very excited about my future now. I think they, their reaction would probably be like, uh, mm, that's, that's not in the cards. That's not going to happen. But if you know through phrasing or something that it is, if through somebody's words, you realize, wait a minute, I think this person has been somewhere pretty close to where I am at right now. So if they have been here and they are now there, maybe it is possible. That's the piece that I think so often is missing. You know, you read a, you read a book from someone with a doctorate that's just clinical information and it's like, okay, you've probably always had a good life. So while these things may be true in a controlled research environment and maybe true on paper, how do they apply to me who's got X, Y, and Z problem that you don't address. But what if they are addressed? What if you hear that message from somebody who has been in their own version, no two people's stories are exactly the same, of course, but has been in their own version of the place you're in right now. And they're not just telling you it can get better. They're showing you like, this is now where I am. There is a path. There is a road from there to here. It's not an easy one. It's not a short one, but it exists and it's a real thing. I think that's going to land different than just somebody essentially saying a longer version of like, I just picture the kitten on like the motivational poster hang in there. Is that a U.S. reference? Do you guys have that poster in Canada? No, we, 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 we've we always got, yeah, there's always like those things <laughs> like the, like the motivational posters from like the yeah. early 2000s that like every teacher had in their classroom. Yeah, yeah. Never once did I look at one of those on a bad day and be like, oh, okay. I, I got it. Today, oh, yes, today is the day. I feel different now because I saw a picture of a monkey jumping through trees. And if that monkey can jump through those trees, I can battle my depression. Like, no, that's, I need a bit more than that. And I think most people do. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that, man. I, and uh, <laughs> that's too funny because I think of that stuff too sometimes. I'm like, man, who's that for? Like, who's that for? I don't know. I, I think it is for corporations to buy to make to feel like they're supporting their employees mental health there used to be there was a brief trend I don't remember when this came out I now I need to look them up again where people got really frustrated with those when they were at the height of their popularity and started making anti-motivational posters which were hilarious and it would show something like a plane crashing and it would be like failure sometimes things just don't work out I actually like those more. I'm like, yeah, some days do feel like that. You know, at least I can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the original meme. Cause like, imagine like, dude, you it come was. in, 
after mm-hmm. like you're like you're like pushing like imagine like you're like a paralegal pushing like 16 hour days and you just yeah. finish like your longest day and you come into the coffee room and you're like pouring yourself a, a coffee because you got to crush like another six hours before you go home and you look at the wall and it just says hang in there you're like dude are you kidding me like, <laughs> yeah that stuff just lands real empty in those moments I think there's there's no context to it it's just I mean, now, you know, culture has changed a bit since then. That stuff now would probably be considered bordering on toxic positivity, I suppose. We're getting a little better at calling that stuff out, which is a very welcome change. But yeah, yeah, it is, you know, you, you mentioned meme and it's, what, what's the flex tape? That's basically what it is. It's like the flex tape meme. I have crippling depression, <laughs> take a walk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is fine now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, my, um my friend's mom i haven't seen her in years i just saw her the other day and she's like telling me about a commercial she saw on tv where it's like uh um a man standing there and he's like yeah i got the best advice in regards to my mental health this week and it's like the first buddy is like hey man up man and then the next person's like uh oh just keep pushing just keep pushing through it and then the next person's like oh don't worry about it like after this work week you'll feel great and we'll have some beers and he's like man it really helped like (laughs) too funny man but um no i like that because like i like that um in your book like you kind of like said a a couple of different things that hit really well with me and it was like a lot of it was you know the very the very first one was kind of like along the lines of what we talked about like you know you don't really i I can't remember the way you phrased it i should have written it down but it was like kind of like um you don't really pick where you start but like your responsibility is how you navigate from there Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I, I think that for some reason, we don't really acknowledge, and by we, I mean like society as a whole, I'm not calling out any one person or group of people here, that your start point in life is completely random. It, it, it is completely random where you start. You don't pick anything. You don't pick your family. You don't pick your country or state or neighborhood you don't pick your genetics, you don't pick your socioeconomic status. And we know that all of those things matter a lot, like a lot, a lot. And it's like, it's somehow supposed to be that no matter what your circumstances are, you can just rise up and conquer them. And to an extent, I believe in that, to an extent. But I believe that in order to do that, you have to first not blame yourself for whatever those circumstances created in your life. And a lot of people ask me like, what, what was your turning point? Like what, what turned things around for you to where you started to go from where you were to where you are? And that was one of the biggest things for me is I stopped blaming myself. I didn't necessarily blame others either because many of those circumstances weren't chosen by them either. But there is a lot of randomness in life. And the things that happen to you early on in life are very important and very formational. Formational. They are not insurmountable, but they are significant. And if you grow up in an environment, and by environment, I mean everything, your family, your friends, your school, Maybe even your first couple of jobs, sports or extracurriculars, you know, these are all, these are all parts of your environment, your neighborhood. If you grow up in an environment where certain things are normal, like not talking about your feelings, for example, as, as a young, still developing person who does not have a fully formed brain, you won't question those things. You're not able to question those things because critical thinking is a skill we develop later on in life. That's why, like, with young kids you can tell them ridiculous stuff sarcastically and they'll take it super seriously like it, it, anyone's got like a young person in their life but they haven't seen you in a while they're like, oh where were you and you'll be like oh i was on mars and they you know they won't laugh or be like oh that's so silly they'd be like oh what were you what were you doing on mars how was mars like they they, they don't realize that's not like a plausible explanation they take it seriously and young people's brains do that with everything. That's why we as humans like learn so quickly and develop 
you know, language and social skills like way beyond other mammals is because early on we are sponges and we just take everything in. And in theory, that's a good thing. But one of the results of that is you enter adult life with baggage. We all do. You don't hit adult life, a blank slate, healed from your childhood and like ready to go and be a parent and a partner and a, a professional and whatever and, and a homeowner and all, all, all these things that we're probably feel pressured to do later on in life. You've got biases, you've got belief systems, you've got habits that you didn't necessarily create or choose that are already in place that are gonna affect how well you do those things. And it's not that you're powerless, it's not that you have to just accept that and be like, oh, well, I guess this is just my life then and I'll never be able to change. But when you blame yourself excessively and, and don't allow yourself to recognize the, the things you struggle with were probably influenced to a high degree by other people and other situations. If you just put it all on you, you end up just thinking you're a piece of garbage. And that actually holds you back from working on it. Because if you feel like I'm just this flawed, broken loser of a person, where's your motivation to work on yourself going to come from? It, feeling a little bit bad about yourself can help you work on it. Feeling too bad about yourself just makes you feel defeated and makes you give up. And it's so easy to swing too far into that direction when we don't acknowledge that not every bad thing in our life is our fault. Yeah, and I think that that in and of itself is like kind of a beautiful message because I think um, it kind of bridges the gap because I, I like, I, I kind of like, I like you, um, kind of um, come from this idea that you know, negativity or pressure or adversity, like that's kind of how we develop. And so like, there's kind of a, a fine line between kind of enabling actions or victim blaming actions. Like there's kind of, because if you feel like you have no responsibility in it whatsoever, then that also means you have no accountability to fix it. Like you have no right. ability to fix it. But then if you also think that you have a hundred percent accountability, it's like, well, my, how did my life end up like this? Obviously, I can't make any good decisions. Like, what should I do from here? Like, there has to be some middle ground where it's like, all right, maybe you didn't pick where you're at because like, man, I don't know if you play video games, but randomizing your character in the very yep. beginning, that's kind of nerve wracking. And then imagine Absolutely. doing that for real life. Like, it's like, dude, that's a dice roll, man. And then you're going to get put into this world and it's like, well, you chose this. It's like, well, no, I didn't really, but the truth is you kind of, you, you, you have a bit of power of how you navigate out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I like your ideology because it, it, it bridges the gap between the two. Like, it's like, maybe you didn't have a hundred percent responsibility of where you started, but you do have a bit of responsibility of how you navigate out of that. Absolutely. The, the way I like to phrase it is we don't, we don't have full control over our lives. We're certainly not helpless either though. We have tremendous influence over our lives. We are very influential people to ourselves, but you do not have full control. You cannot just pick the exact life you want and through sheer force of will and sheer hard work, develop that life. You may be able to get elements of it, but we don't just get to, it, the video games analogy is good. Uh, there's no character creator in life. You can't just design the perfect person with the perfect backstory and just be them. And a lot of us are saddled early on with things that aren't our faults that we didn't choose, like depression, for example. No one chooses depression. No, no one sets out thinking, you know what I'd really like is to have periods of time every year where I can't feel anything good. No one's gonna pick that for themselves. And if you start to experience depressive episodes from an early point in life, that's going to affect you academically. It's going to affect you socially. It's gonna affect you occupationally. It's, it, it puts life on a higher difficulty level. It's not an even playing field for everybody. And if you take 100% accountability and responsibility for everything, you end up blaming yourself for things you have no control over. And that will paradoxically make you feel powerless. Trying to take full control over everything will make you feel like you have no control because you will be taking responsibility for things 
that don't actually belong to you. Things that you were just saddled with, things that were just given to you or part of your random character creator or your random backstory that you probably would have preferred not to have if you had things your way. And you can't just blame yourself for everything. It will shut you down, it will bottleneck you, and it will make you feel stuck. And it's all about finding that middle ground. That's what I try to help people do both in the book and in therapy. Yeah, like I know um, with myself, like one of the things I always have to tell myself, because I mean, like I dealt with depression at a young age. And for me, like I, I tend to, and this is just in the last couple of years through like kind of working with people and, and having a little bit of reflection time. But it's like, I realized that a lot of the time I masked kind of my, um, you know, my sadness or depression with anger. Like anytime I get confused sure. or anxious or anything like that, like it kind of gets masked either as the class clown or extreme aggression like that's kind of where there's no middle ground for me but I had to you know I had to realize to myself like it's kind of like um you know you don't control the world like you hear those like cliches you don't control the world you control how you react to it but that's like kind of where I told myself like it's like I don't have to blame myself for feeling this anger or this depression or anything like that but I do sometimes have to take responsibility for my accountability like my my reaction to it like did you put a hole in the drywall with your fist that's your fault like, like maybe right, you should right. reconcile Absolutely. that. Like, yeah, you could have not done that, but the anger that you felt about whatever the situation was that made you want to do that is not your fault and is not inherently a bad thing either. Um, it, it, and, and this is not just my opinion. This is neurology. These are things that we know in, in psychology and neurosciences emotions themselves are not conscious decisions we don't choose at least not from a moment to moment basis you can make choices in your life that overall will like increase feelings of joy for example so again you have influence but your moment to moment emotional experience is not a conscious choice it is a reaction to things happening inside and outside of you just like the experience of physical pain is not a conscious choice. And just like physical pain, sometimes things don't feel the way you might think. Like sometimes you can get hurt quite badly and not feel like it's a big deal. I fractured my thumb at the gym and didn't go to the ER for two hours because I didn't realize I was really hurt. I thought it was just a bruise. Then on the flip side, sometimes I get a paper cut and I want to cry. <laughs> And it's like, you look at it and it's like, it's just a paper cut. It's not that big a deal. It shouldn't hurt that bad, but it hurts however much it hurts. And that's your nervous system communicating information to you. It's not a choice. There's no morality in that. There's no more decision in that. It's a thing that happens to you. Um, and yes, what you do with those emotions, you have quite a bit of saying, and um, there are certainly gonna be choices that are, are gonna be more helpful than others, but do not blame yourself for the feelings themselves, because they are not your choice. And I also don't believe they can be inherently right or wrong. I don't believe that any feeling is bad. And that includes anger. Anger is an important feeling. If you, anger gets scapegoated a lot, but imagine a life where you were incapable of anger. That would not be good. Your relationships, yeah, it would be completely unsafe your relationships would probably be so one-sided. People would be taking advantage of you left and right. Um, not even just interpersonally. I mean, like your job, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know if you were, you wouldn't have frustrations about being overworked or underpaid. I mean, you'd be so easily taken advantage of by other people because anger many times is a sign that we're, we're being mistreated. We're not being treated the way we'd like to. And it's important to know when that's happening. Just like physical pain is important. There are people who have conditions where they can't feel physical pain and their lives are very dangerous. They can't, they can't do normal things. They can't play sports because they can severely injure themselves and not know it and keep going and do some serious long-term damage to themselves. The painful emotions no, they're not pleasant. They're not fun. We're not looking forward to them, but they are very important. You absolutely need to be able to feel them. It's not bad. It's not immoral. It's not weakness. You need those. You're built with those for a reason. Yeah, I um, 
there's a story my mom always tells about me when she's telling people about me, but it's, it's a funny story. And it always reminds me of that, but uh, it's like when I'm two years old, I go up to the fireplace and she's like, don't touch the glass. And I continued to melt my palms to the glass. Yeah. And after that, I, I learned my lesson, like pain's a lesson teacher. Like it's kind of like yeah. instructor that way. I got to ask, um, we're coming up on two o'clock or I guess uh, it's four o'clock for you or three. yeah. Yeah. Do you have a time constraint? You got a jet in a couple of minutes. Here? I do have a four o'clock. Let me make sure that's still true. Every now and then people cancel. Cause, Cause I'll talk forever, there. man, but I just want to make sure I'm in. <laughs> I know I would too. Time. I probably, I probably will need to go in a few minutes here. Um, yeah, I do still have a four o'clock, so we'll need okay. to wrap up in a few minutes here. I got, I got two questions then for you. Sure. Well, I guess, um, these aren't really like one of them I was going to plan on asking you, um, but one of them I'm kind of more passionate about. So I'll start with this just because I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I liked, um, because like, if you tell someone like, look, man, like you're in this position and then you can work your way out of it. A lot of us, like myself, like I've been in positions where I start taking on like 60, 70 hour weeks. And then I start burning myself out. And then I'm sitting here wondering like, well, I was told that doing the work would get me forward, but now I'm burning out. And then right. there's been other times where I'm working twice as much as that, but I feel like I've got double the energy. And you mm -hmm. said something in your book that you said, um, work doesn't burn us out, stress burns us out. And I right. wanted to pick your brain about that because uh, I'm in a point in my life where, you know, I'm putting out like pretty much the maximum output I've ever put in my life and sure. I feel good. And I think yeah. it's because yeah. of what you were talking about in terms of stress. So I wanted to pick your brain on that, man. Yeah. Stress is about one of the biggest sources of stress is, is caring deeply about things or being responsible for things or putting a lot of effort into things where you don't really have a ton of say in the outcome. And, and that's what leads us to burnout a lot. So like trying to fix other people's problems, for example, um, is a very stressful thing because you can't, you can't make hundred percent sure that things go the way you want them to go. And Work in and of itself doesn't necessarily burn you out. It depends on what your ratio of like reward to effort is. If you're working very hard on things that give you more than you put into them, as far as feelings of reward, or pride, or accomplishment, or energy, for most people, that's going to be sustainable. I, I'm at the same place as you. I am by far the busiest I have ever been, both at work and at home. And that's, again, like if you had told 14-year-old me that this would be my life, a part of me would have been like, the hell, I don't want that. <laughs> like that's, that's too much stuff. Um, because at that point in my life, just doing the bare minimum was debilitating. Like I couldn't even handle that. But it's because I wasn't getting anything out of it. And doing hard things doesn't always drain me. If you have, if you are investing yourself into things where you feel that you can, can like have a good amount of influence on the outcome and you're getting a lot of reward out of doing them, then that's usually pretty sustainable. But investing a lot of yourself into things that can go whichever way, um, that's going to lead you to burn out pretty quick. So I, I really think it's a lot about like where you're at in life and what you have to give and where you have control. One variable that you can tweak a little bit to help you with that though is your sense of reward after completing a task. I am very mindful, trying to make sure I always in some way, shape or form reward myself for every hard thing that I do. When I fix up a room in our fixer upper house, I usually just like sit in it for a few minutes afterwards and, and just look at it. And I remember the way it used to look and I look at the way it is now and I say, I did that, it feels good. You know, Every time I walk in this room, I'm gonna remember all the work I put in and that makes it rewarding. That makes me want to do more. If it's when it's just go, 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 but there's no reward when there's no reinforcement for what you're doing, then that's probably not going to be sustainable. And you are going to burn yourself out pretty quick. So it's all about finding ways to make what you're doing feel worthwhile to you. I believe that if we feel like what we're doing is worthwhile and matters and is worth doing, we can keep going. And if it's not, if it doesn't feel that way, even if it isn't that hard, we will burn out quickly. I think, I think like a lot of housework is a good example of that. I know people who have, you know, like very demanding, you know, 
50 hour, 60 hour a week jobs and they do it well and they're you know, getting promoted, getting raises and things like that. And then they go home and, and it's like, I can't put my laundry away. Why is that? Obviously that task is not harder than the things you've been doing all day long. In fact, it's much, much, much easier. But if you don't feel like it's worth it, if you don't find having like a nice clean closet to be a rewarding experience, then you don't care. And it's like, it's like investing your money into something that's not gonna give you any return. Even if, if, if someone says, hey, Mark, if you invest a thousand dollars into this company, I guarantee a week from now, you'll have 1500 back. Even though a thousand dollars is a big investment they're asking for, they guarantee you that you're going to make $500 on that. You're going to do that every time, right? Assuming you have $1,000. If I say to you, if you invest $5 a week from now, I will give you $5. Why bother? There's no point to that, right? $5 maybe isn't a big deal to you, but if there's no reward from investing it, why bother? It doesn't matter that that's a very small investment that I'm asking because it's worthless. It doesn't do anything for you. So that's what it's all about is figuring out ways to set up your day to where the things you do feel worth it. If you can find ways to do that, and I have a whole chapter in the book about this because it's, it's easier said than done, I know. If you find ways to do that, you can do hard things all day long. If you can't find ways to do that, even the little stuff can crush you. Yeah, hundred percent. And just thinking that you deserve those things. Like that was a lot of the, like when you talk about like, you know, keeping a clean home, that was a lot of the mental transformation I had to think of. It's like, dude, I deserve to live in a clean home. You know, like I deserve to come home and, and, and cook on a clean stovetop or go to the bathroom in a clean bathroom. Like, so for me, like that was the mental transformation I had to go through. But um, yeah, I mean, dude, I love that response. I love that. And uh, it was just something that kind of helped me out because I was like, waiting for this burnout now and i'm like yeah. i'm not getting it because i'm deleting the stress like i'm actively doing things that delete the stress mm -hmm. but um exactly. hey man out of respect for your time like i want i want to say like thank you so much for uh for jumping on here and doing this with me i know you got a patient or a uh, client coming up but i mean um it's it's for when everything's burning dr eilers and then your instagram is like it's uh dot dr dot scott dot eilers am i right yep. i'm trying to it's shout literally you out just my name. Yep. as good as i can <laughs> there but for anyone that wants to go and check out his instagram and check out his book i highly recommend it help me out but uh thank you so much man i don't want to take up too much more of your time i appreciate you man no worries thank you for having me i appreciate your time thank you for being an excellent host and giving me an opportunity to talk to some people about stuff that matters to me so glad you enjoyed the book and i'll be talking to you soon on instagram probably yeah hell yeah man i'm gonna message you right after this but uh dude great guy man i really like talking to you and i like that this is like the first time we've ever talked but it just flowed so naturally bro i uh i really appreciate you and i look forward to round two if you're down for it man so thank you so absolutely. much absolutely let's talk I'll about that take care mark talk to you later enjoy the rest of your day take care brother Thanks. thank you so you much too. bye